Section 18 of Arts and Crafts Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Of Embroidery by May Morris. The technicalities of embroidery are very simple, and its tools few, practically consisting of a needle and nothing else. The work can be wrought loose in the hand or stretched in a frame, which latter mode is often advisable, always when smooth and minute work is aimed at. There are no mysteries of method beyond a few elementary rules that can be quickly learnt. No way to perfection except that of care and patience and love of the work itself. This being so, the more is demanded from design and execution. We look for complete triumph over the limitations of process and material, and what is equally important, a certain judgment and self-restraint, and, in short, those mental qualities that distinguish mechanical from intelligent work. The latitude allowed to the worker, the lavishness and ingenuity displayed in the stitches employed, in short, the vivid expression of the worker's individuality, form a great part of the success of needlework. The varieties of stitch are too many to be closely described without diagrams, but the chief are as follows. Chain stitch consists of loops simulating the links of a simple chain. Some of the most famous work of the Middle Ages was worked in this stitch, which is enduring, and of its nature necessitates careful execution. We are more familiar with it in the dainty work of the 17th and 18th centuries, in the airy brightness and simplicity of which lies a peculiar charm, contrasted with the more pompous and pretentious work of the same period. This stitch is also wrought with a hook on any loose material stretched in a tambour frame. Tapestry stitch consists of a building up of stitches laid one beside another and gives a surface slightly resembling that of tapestry. I give the name as it is so often used, but it is vague and leads to the confusion that exists in people's minds between loom tapestry and embroidery. The stitch is worked in a frame and is particularly suitable for the drapery of figures and anything that requires skillful blending of several colors, or a certain amount of shading. This facility of painting with the needle is in itself a danger, for it tempts some people to produce a highly shaded imitation of a picture, an attempt which must be a failure, both as a decorative and as a pictorial achievement. It cannot be said too often that the essential qualities of all good needlework are a broad surface, bold lines, and pure, brilliant, and, as a rule, simple coloring, all of which being qualities attainable through, and prescribed by, the limitations of this art. Applique has been, and is still, a favorite method of work, which Vasari tells us Botticelli praised as being very suitable to processional banners and hangings used in the open air, as it is solid and enduring, also bold and effective in style. It is more accurately described as a method of work, in which various stitches are made use of, for it consists of designs embroidered on a stout ground and then cut out and laid on silk or velvet and edged round with lines of gold or silk, and sometimes with pearls. It requires considerable deftness and judgment in applying, as the work could well be spoilt by clumsy and heavy finishing. It is now looked upon as solely ecclesiastical, I believe, and is associated in our minds with garish red, gold, and white, and with dull geometric ornament, though there is absolutely no reason why church embroidery of today should be limited to ungraceful forms and staring colors. A certain period of work, thick and solid, but not very interesting, either as to method or design, has been stereotyped into what is known as ecclesiastical embroidery, the mechanical characteristics of the style being, of course, emphasized and exaggerated in the process. Church work will never be of the finest, while these characteristics are insisted on. The more pity, as it is seemly, that the richest and noblest work should be devoted to churches, and to all buildings that belong to and are an expression of the communal life of the people. Another and simpler form of applied work is to cut out the desired forms in one material and lay upon another, securing the applique with stitches round the outline, which are hidden by an edging cord. The work may be further enriched by light ornament of lines and flourishes laid directly on the ground material. Couching is an effective method of work in which broad masses of silk or gold thread are laid down 
and secured by a network or diaper of crossing threads, through which the under surface shines very prettily. It is often used in conjunction with applique. There are as many varieties of couching stitches as the worker has invention for. In some, the threads are laid simply and flatly on the form to be covered, while in others a slight relief is obtained by layers of soft linen thread which form a kind of molding or stuffing, and which are covered by the silk threads or whatever is to be the final decorative surface. The ingenious patchwork coverlets of our grandmothers, formed of scraps of old gowns pieced together in certain symmetrical forms, constitute the romance of family history, but this method has an older origin than would be imagined. Queen Isis M. Keb's embalmed body went down the Nile to its burial place under a canopy that was lately discovered, and is preserved in the Bulak Museum. It consists of many squares of gazelle hide of different colors, sewn together and ornamented with various devices. Under the name of patchwork, or mosaic-like piecing together of different colored stuffs, comes also the Persian work made at rest. Bits of fine cloth are cut out for leaves, flowers, and so forth, and neatly stitched together with great accuracy. This done, the work is further carried out and enriched by chain and other stitches. The result is perfectly smooth, flat work, no easy feat when done on a large scale, as it often is. Darning and running need little explanation. The former stitch is familiar to us in the well-known Cretan and Turkish cloths. The stitch here is used mechanically in parallel lines and simulates weaving, so that these handsome borders in a deep, rich red might as well have come from the loom as from the needle. Another method of darning is looser and coarser, and suitable only for cloths and hangings not subject to much wear and rubbing. The stitches follow the curves of the design, which the needle paints, as it were, shading and blending the colors. It is necessary to use this facility for shading temperately, however, or the flatness essential to the decorative work is lost. The foregoing is a rough list of stitches which could be copiously supplemented, but that I am obliged to pass on to another important point, that of design. If needlework is to be looked upon seriously, it is necessary to secure appropriate and practicable designs. Where the worker does not invent for herself, she should at least interpret her designer, just as the designer interprets and does not attempt to imitate nature. It follows from this that it is better to avoid using designs of artists who know nothing of the capacities of needlework, and design beautiful and intricate forms without reference to the execution, the result being unsatisfactory and incomplete. Regarding the design itself, broad, bold lines should be chosen, and broad, harmonious color, which should be roughly planned before setting to work, with as much minute work and stitches introducing play of color as befits the purpose of the work and humor of the worker. There should be no scratching, no indefiniteness of form or color, no vagueness that allows the eye to puzzle over the design, beyond that indefinable sense of mystery which arrests the attention and withholds the full charm of the work for a moment, to unfold it to those who stop to give it more than a glance." But there are so many different stitches and so many different modes of setting to work that it will soon be seen that these few hints do not apply to all of them. One method, for instance, consists of trusting entirely to design and leaves color out of account. White work on white linen, white on dark ground, or black and dark blue upon white. Again, some work depends more on magnificence of color than on form, as, for example, the handsome Italian hangings of the 17th century, worked in floss silk on linen sometimes, and sometimes on a dusky open canvas, which makes the silks gleam and glow like precious stones. In thus slightly describing the methods chiefly used in embroidery, I do so principally from old examples, as modern embroidery, being a dilettante pastime, has little distinct character, and is, in its best points, usually imitative. Eastern work still retains the old professional skill, but beauty of color is rapidly disappearing, and little attention is paid to durability of the dyes used. In speaking rather slightingly of modern needlework, I must add that its non-success is often due more to the use of poor materials than to want of skill in working. It is surely folly to waste time over work that looks shabby in a month. The worker should use judgment and thought to procure materials, not necessarily rich, but each good and genuine of his kind. Lastly, she should not be sparing of her own handiwork. 
for while a slightly executed piece of work depends wholly on design in one where the actual stitchery is more elaborate but the design less masterly the patience and thought lavished on it render it in a different way equally pleasing and bring it more within the scope of the amateur may morris end of section eighteen Section 19 of Arts and Crafts Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Of Lace by Alan S. Cole. Lace is a term freely used at the present time to describe various sorts of open ornament in thread work the successful effect of which depends very much upon the contrasting of more or less closely textured forms with grounds or intervening spaces filled in with meshes of equal size or with cross ties bars etc whence it has come to pass that fabrics having an appearance of this description such as embroideries upon nets cut linen works drawn thread works and machine woven counterfeits of lace-like fabrics are frequently called laces but they differ in make from those productions of certain specialized handicrafts to which from the sixteenth to the eighteenth centuries lace owes its fame these specialized handicrafts are divisible into two branches the one branch involves the employment of a needle to loop a continuous thread into varieties of shapes and devices the other is in the nature of making corresponding or similar ornament by twisting and plaiting together a number of separate threads the loose ends of which have to be fastened in a row on a cushion or pillow the supply of the threads being wound around the heads of lengthened bobbins so shaped for convenience in handling the first named branch is needlepoint lace making the second bobbin or pillow lace making needlepoint lace making may be regarded as a species of embroidery whilst bobbin or pillow lace making is closely allied to the twisting and knotting together of threads for fringes embroidery however postulates a foundation of material to be enriched with needlework whereas needlepoint and pillow lace are wrought independently of any corresponding foundation of material the production of slender needles and small metal pins is an important incident in the history of lace making by hand broadly speaking the manufacture for a widespread consumption of such metal pins and needles does not date earlier than the fourteenth century without small implements of this character delicate lace-making is not possible it is therefore fair to assume that although historic nations like the egyptian assyrian hebrew greek and roman made use of fringes and knotted cords upon their hangings cloaks and tunics lace was unknown to them their bone wooden or metal pins and needles were suited to certain classes of embroidery and to the making of nets looped cords etc but not to such lace making as we know it from the early days of the sixteenth century about the end of the fifteenth century with the development in europe of fine linen for underclothing collars and cuffs just visible beyond the outer garments came into vogue and a taste was speedily manifested for trimming linen undershirts collars and cuffs with insertions and borders of kindred material this taste seems to have been first displayed in a marked manner by venetian and flemish women for the earliest known books of engraved patterns for linen ornamental borders and insertions are those which were published during the commencement of the sixteenth century at venice and antwerp but such patterns were designed in the first place for various sorts of embroidery upon a material such as darning upon canvas punto fa sulla rete a maglia quadra drawn threadwork of reticulated patterns punto tirato or punto a reticella and cutwork punto tagliato patterns for quite other sorts of work 
such as point in the air, punto in aere, and thread work twisted and plaited by means of little leaden weights or bobbins, merletti a piombini, were about thirty years later in publication. These two last named classes of work are respectively identifiable, punto in aere, with needlepoint, and merletti a piombini, with bobbin lace making, and they seem to date from about 1540. The 16th century and earliest known needlepoint laces, punto in aere, are of narrow lengths or bands, the patterns of which are composed principally of repeated open squares filled in with circular, star, and other geometric shapes, set upon diagonal and cross lines which radiate from the center of each square to its corners and sides. When the bands were to serve as borders, they would have a dentated edging added to them. This edging might be made of either needlepoint or bobbin lace. As time went on, the dimensions of both lace bands and lace van dykes increased, so that, whilst these served as trimmings to linen, lace of considerable width and various shapes came to be made, and ruffs, collars, and cuffs were wholly made of it. Such lace was thin and wiry in appearance. The leading lines of the patterns formed squares and geometrical figures, amongst which were disposed small wheel and seed forms, little triangles, and such like. A few years later, the details of these geometrically planned patterns became more varied, tiny human figures, fruits, vases, and flowers being used as ornamental details. But a more distinct change in character of pattern was effected when flowing scrolls with leaf and blossom devices, held together by means of little ties or bars, were adopted. Different portions of the scrolls and blossoms with their connecting links or bars would often be enriched with little loops or picots, with stitched reliefs, and varieties of close and open work. Then came a taste for arranging the bars or ties into trellis grounds or grounds of hexagons, over which small ornamental devices would be scattered in balanced groups. At the same time, the bobbin or pillow lace workers produced grounds of small, equal size meshes in plated threads. This inventiveness on the part of the bobbin or pillow workers reacted upon the needlepoint workers, who, in their turn, produced still more delicate grounds with meshes of single and double twisted threads. Lace, passing from stage to stage, thus became a filmy tissue or fabric and its original use as a somewhat stiff, wiry-looking trimming to linen consequently changed. Larger articles than borders, collars, and cuffs were made of the new filmy material, and lace flounces, veils, loose sleeves, curtains, and bed covers were produced. This transition may be traced through the first hundred and twenty years of lace-making. It culminated during the succeeding ninety years in a development of fanciful pattern-making in which realistic representation of flowers trees cupids warriors sportsmen animals of the chase emblems of all sorts rococo and architectural ornament is typical whilst the eighteenth century may perhaps be regarded as a period of questionable propriety in the employment of ornament hardly appropriate to the twisting, plating, and looping together of threads, it is nevertheless notable for tour de force in lace-making achieved without regard to cost or trouble. From this stage, the climax of which may be placed about 1760, the designing of lace patterns declined, and from the end of the 18th to the first twenty years or so of the 19th centuries, Laces, although still made with the needle and bobbins, became little more than finely meshed nets powdered over with dots or leaves, or single blossoms or tiny sprays. Within the limits of a brief note like the present, it is not possible to discuss local peculiarities in methods of work and styles of design 
which established the characters of the various venetian and other italian points of the french points of alencon and argentan of the cloudy valenciennes and mechlin and brussels laces neither can one touch upon the nurturing of the industry by nuns in convents by workers subsidized by state grants and so forth it would require more space than is available to fairly discuss what styles of ornament are least or most suited to lace-making or whether lace is less rightly employed as a tissue for the making of entire articles of costume or of household use than as an ornamental accessory or trimming to costume whilst very much lace is a fantastic adjunct to costume serving a purpose sometimes like that of appoggiature and fioriture in music other lace such as the carved ivory-looking scrolls of venetian raised points which are principally associated with the jabot and ruffles of kings ministers and marshals and with the ornamentation of priests vestments is certainly more dignified in character the loops twists and plates of threads are more noticeable in laces of comparatively small dimensions than they are in laces of great size size rather tempts the lace worker to strive for ready effect and to sacrifice the minuteness and finish of handwork which give quality of preciousness to lace the via media to this quality lies between two extremes namely applying dainty threads to the interpretation of badly shaped and ill-grouped forms on the one hand and on the other hand adopting a style of ornament which depends upon largeness of detail and massiveness in grouping and is therefore unsuited to lace without finish of handicraft producing beautiful ornament suited to the material in which it is expressed lace worthy the name cannot be made the industry is still pursued in france belgium venice austria bohemia and ireland honiton has acquired a notoriety for its pillow laces many of which some hundred years ago were as varied and well executed as brussels pillow laces other english towns in the midland counties followed the lead chiefly of mechlin valenciennes lille and arras but were rarely as successful as their leaders saxony russia and the auvergne produced quantities of pillow laces having little pretense to design though capable of pretty effects when artistically worn there is no question that the want of a sustained intelligence in appreciating ingenious handmade laces has told severely upon the industry and as with other artistic handicrafts so with lace-making machinery has very considerably supplanted the hand there is at present a limited revival in the demand for handmade laces and efforts are made at certain centers to give new life to the industry by infusing into it artistic feeling derived from a study of work done during the periods when the art flourished end of section 19 recording by linda johnson section 21 of arts and crafts essays this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Emily Ugia in Florida, United States. Of Designs and Working Drawings by Louise F. Day. The drawings which most deeply interest the workmen are working drawings just the last to be appreciated by the public because they are the last to be understood the most admired of show drawings are to us craftsmen comparatively without interest we recognize the competition drawing at once we see how it was made in order to secure the commission not with a view to its effect in execution which is the true and only end of a design and we do not wonder at the failure of competitions in general. For the man who cares least, if even he knows at all, 
how a design will appear in execution is the most likely to perpetrate a preemptiveness, which may gain the favor of the inexpert, with whom the selection is likely to rest. The general public, and all in fact who are technically ignorant on the subject, need to be warned that the most attractive and what are called taking drawings are just those which are least likely to be designs, still less bona fide working drawings. The real workman has not the time, even if he had the inclination, to finish up his drawings to the point that is generally considered pleasing. The inventive spirit has not the patience. We have each of us the feelings complementary to our faculties, and vice versa. And you will usually find, certainly it is my experience, that the makers of very elaborately finished drawings seldom do anything but what we have often seen before, and that men of any individuality, actual designers that is to say, have a way of considering a drawing finished as soon as ever it expresses what they mean. You may take it then, as a general rule that highly finished and elaborate drawings are got up for show, finished for exhibition, as they say. In compliance with the supposed requirements of an exhibition, rather than with a view to practical purposes, and that drawings completed only so far as is necessary, precise in their details, disfigured by notes in writing, sections, and so on, are at least genuine workaday designs. If you ask what a design should be like, well, like a design. It is altogether a different thing from a picture. It is almost the reverse of it. Practically, no man has, as I said, the leisure, even if he had the ability, to make an effective finished picture of a thing yet to be carried out. Perhaps not to be carried out. This last is a most serious consideration for him, and may have a sad effect upon his work. The artist who could afford thus to give himself away gratis would certainly not do so. The man who might be willing to do it could not. For if he has got no work to do, that is at least presumptive evidence that he is not precisely a master of his craft. The design that looks like a picture is likely to be at best a reminiscence of something done before, and the more often it has been done, the more likely it is to be pictorially successful, and by so much the less is it, strictly speaking, a design. This applies especially to designs on a small scale, such as are usually submitted to catch the rare commission. To imitate in a full-sized cartoon the texture of material, the casualty of reflected light, and other such accidents of effect, is sheer nonsense, and no practical workman would think of such a thing. A painter put to the uncongenial task of decorative design might be excused for attempting to make his productions past master by workmanship excellent in itself, although not in the least to the point. One does what one can, or what one must. And if a man has a faculty he needs, must show it. Only the perfection of painting will not, for all that, make design. In the first small sketch design, everything need not of course be expressed, but it should be indicated, for the purpose is simply to explain the scheme proposed. So much of pictorial representation as may be necessary to that is desirable, and no more. It should be in the nature of a diagram, specific enough to illustrate the idea and how it is to be worked out. It ought by strict rights to commit one definitely to a certain method of execution, as a written specification would and may often with advantage be helped out by written notes, which explain more definitely than any pictorial rendering just how this is to be wrought, that cast, the other chased, and so on, as the case may be. Whatever the method of expression the artist may adopt, 
he should be perfectly clear in his own mind how his design is to be worked out and he ought to make it clear also to anyone with sufficient technical knowledge to understand a join in the first sketch for a window for example he need not show every lead and every piece of glass but there should be no possible mistake as to how it is to be glazed or which is painted glass and which is mosaic to omit the necessary bars in the sketch for glass seems to me a weak concession to the prejudice of the public one may have to concede such points sometimes but a concession is due less to necessity than to the what shall we call it not perhaps exactly the cowardice but at all events the timidity of the artist in the full size the working joy or cartoon everything material to the design should be expressed and that as definitely as possible in a cartoon for glass to take again the same example every lead line should be shown as well as the set of bars to omit them is about as excusable as it would be to leave out the sections from a design for cabinet work it is contended sometimes that such details are not necessary that the artist can bear all that in mind doubtless he can more or less but i am inclined to believe more strongly in the less at any rate he will much more certainly have them in view whilst he keeps them visibly before his eyes one thing that deters him is the fear of offending the client who will not believe when he sees lets and bars in the drawing how little they are likely to assert themselves in the glass very much the same thing applies to designs and working joints generally a thorough craftsman never suggests a form or color without realizing in his own mind how he will be able to get such form or color in the actual work and in his working joint he explains that fully making allowance even for some not impossible dullness of apprehension on the part of the executant thus if a pattern is to be woven he indicates the cards to be employed he arranges what parts are single what double as the weavers call it what changes in the shadow are proposed and by the crossing of which threads certain intermediate tints are to be obtained or again if the design is for wallpaper printing he arranges not only for the blocks but order in which they shall be printed and provides for possible printing in flock or for the printing of one transparent color over another so as to get more colors then there are blocks used and so on in neither case too he shows quite plainly the limits of each color not so much seeking the softness of effect which is his ultimate aim as the precision which will enable the block or cart cutter to see at a glance what he means even at the risk of a certain hardness in his drawing for the drawing is in itself of no account it is only the means to an end and his end is the stuff the paper or whatever it may be in execution a workman intent on his design will sacrifice his drawing to it harden it as i said for the sake of emphasis annotate it patch it cut it up into pieces to prove it if need be do anything to make his meaning clear to the workman who comes after him it is as a rule only the dilettante who is dainty about preserving his drawings to an artist very much in repute there may be some temptation to be careful of his designs and to elaborate them himself or by the hands of his assistants because so finished they have a commercial value as drawings but this is at best pot boiling and only men who are subject to this temptation are just those who might be proof against it men of such rank that even their working joints are in demand have no very urgent need to work for the pot and the working joints of men to whom pounds and shillings must needs be a real consideration are not sought after in the case 
of very smart and highly finished drawings by comparatively unknown designers, of 99 out of 100, that is to say, or 999 out of 1000 perhaps. Elaboration implies either that, having little to say, a man fills up his time in saying it at unnecessary length, or that he is working for exhibition. And why not work for exhibition? You may be asked. There is a simple answer to that. The exhibition pitch is in much too high a key, and in the long run, it will ruin the faculty of the workman who adopts it. It is only fair to admit that an exhibition of fragmentary and unfinished joints, soiled, tattered, and torn, as they almost invariably come from the workshop or factory, would make a very poor show which may be an argument against exhibiting them at all. Certainly, it is a reason for mending, cleaning, and mounting them, and putting them in some sort of frame, for what is not worth the pains of making presentable is not worth showing. But that is a very different thing from working designs up to picture pitch. When all is said, designs, if exhibited, appeal primarily to designers. We all want to see each other's work, and especially each other's way of working. But it should not be altogether uninteresting to the intelligent amateur to see what working joints are, and to compare them with the kind of specious competition joints by which he is so apt to be misled. Louis F. Day End of section 21「Section 22 of Arts and Crafts Essays」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Shasta, Oakland, California. Furniture and the Room by Edward S. Pryor the art of furnishings runs on two wheels, the room and the furniture. As in the bicycle, the inordinate development of one wheel at the expense of its colleague has not been without some great feats, yet too often has provoked catastrophe. So furnishing makes safest pr progression when, with a juster proportion, its two wheels are kept to moderate and uniform diameters. The room should be for the furniture just as much as the furniture for the room. Of late, it has not been so. We have been indulging in a disproportionately wheeled type, and the result has been to crowd our rooms and reduce them to insignificance. Even locomotion in them is often embarrassing, especially when the upholsterer has been allowed carte blanche. But apart from this, there is a sense of repletion in these masses of chattel, miscellanies brought together with no subordination to each other or to the effect of the room as a whole. Taken in the single piece, our furniture is sometimes not without its merit, but it is rarely exempt from self-assertion, or to use a slang term, fussiness, and an aggregation of fussinesses becomes fatiguing. One is betrayed into uncivilized longings for the workhouse or even the convict's cell, the simplicity of bare boards and tables. But we must not use our dictum, dictum for aggressive purposes only. Faulty as modern systems may be, in the distinction of the two sides of the problem of furnishing, the room for the furniture and the furniture for the room, there is some historical significance. Under these titles might be written, respectively, the first and last chapters in the his history of this art its rise and its decadence furniture in the embryonic state 
of chests which held the positions of early times and served as they moved from place to place for tables chairs and wardrobes may have been in existence while the tents and sheds which accommodated them were of less value but furnishing began with settled architecture when the room grew first into importance and overshadowed its contents the art of the builder has soared far beyond the ambitions of the furnisher later the two constituents of our art came to be produced simultaneously and under one impulse of design the room whether church or hall has now its specific furniture in the former this was adapted for ritual in the latter for feasting but in both the contents formed an in idea an art integral part of the interior in which they stood and while these conditions endured the art was in its palmy state later furniture came to be considered apart from its position it grew fanciful and fortuitous the problem of fitting it to the room was no problem at all while both sprang from a common conception it became so when its independent design at first a foible of luxury grew to be a necessity of production as long however as architecture remained dominant and painting and sculpture were its acknowledged vassals furniture retained its legitimate position and shared in their triumphs but when these the elder sisters shook off their allegiance furniture followed suit it developed the self-assertion of which we have spoken and in the belief that it could stand alone divorced itself from that support which the, was the final cause of its existence there have been doubtless many slackenings and tightenings of the chain which link the arts of design together but it is to be noted how with each slackening furniture grew gorgeous and artificial failed to sympathize with common needs and sank slowly into feebleness and insipidity. we had passed through some such cycle by the middle of this century with the dissolution of old ties the majority of the decorative arts had perished painting remained to us aggregating to herself the role which hitherto the whole company had combined to make successful in her struggle to fill the giant's robe she has run unresistingly in the, the ruts of the age she has crowded her portable canvases side by side into exhibitions and galleries and claimed the title of art for literary rather than aesthetic suggestions the minor coquetries of craftsmanship from which once was nourished the burly strength of art have felt out of place in such illustrious company so we have the forced art of public display but it has ceased to be the habit in which our common rooms and homely walls could be dressed the attendant symptom has been the lost from our houses of all that architectural amalgam which in former times blended the structure with its contents the screens and panelings which half room half furniture cemented the one to the other the eighteenth century carried on the tradition to a great extent with plinth and dado cornice and encrusted ceiling but by the middle of the nineteenth we had our interiors handed over to us by the architect almost completely void of architectural feature we are asked to take as a substitute what is naively called decoration two coats of paint and a veneer of machine printed wallpapers 
in this progress of obliteration an important factor has been the increasing brevity of our tenures three or four times in twenty years the outgoing tenant will make good his dilapidations and the house agent will put the premises into tenantable repair as these things are settled for us by lawyers and surveyors after a series of such pr processes what can remain of internal architecture can there be left even a room worth furnishing in the true sense of the term the first step is to render it so must usually be the obliteration of as much as possible of the maimed and distorted construction which our leasehold house offers what then if furniture beginning again to account herself an art should have transgressed her limits and invaded the room ceilings walls and floors chimney pieces grates doors and windows all nowadays come into the hands of the artistic furnisher and are at the mercy of upholsterers and cabinet makers to begin with and of the antiquity collector to follow then we bring in our gardens and finish off our drawing rooms as a mixture of conservatory and a bric-a-brac shop the fashion for archaeological mimicry has been another pitfall the attempt to bring back art by complete reproductions of old-day furnishings has been much the vogue abroad the parisians distinguish many styles and affect to carry them out in every detail the americans have copied paris and we have done a little ourselves but the weak element in all this the and that the occupier of these medieval or classic apartments remains still the nineteenth century embodiment which we meet in railway carriages and omnibus we cannot be cultured epicureans in a drawing-room of the roman empire and by the opening of a door as flemish burgomasters into our libraries the heart of the age will mould its productions irrespective of fashion or archaeology and such miserable shams fail to reach it if we who live in this century can at all ourselves appraise the position its most essential characteristics in its bearing upon art has been the commercial tendency thereby an indelible stamp is sent upon our furniture the making of it under the supreme condition of profitable sale has affected it in both its functions on the side of utility our furniture has been shaped to the uses of the million not of the individual hence its monotonously average character its failure to become part of ourselves its lack of personal and local charm how should a stock article possess either but the blight has fallen more cruelly on that other function which is a necessity of human craftsmanship the effort to express itself and please the eye by the expression art being the monopoly of painting and having nothing to do with such vulgar matters as furniture commercialism has been able to advance a standard of beauty of its own with one canon that of speedy profits furniture has become a mere wear in the market of fashion bought to-day as the rage it is discarded to-morrow and some new fancy purchased the tradesman has a new margin of profit but the customer is just where he was it may be granted that a genuine necessity of sale is the stimulus to which all serious effort in the arts must look for progress and without which they would become fadism and conceit but it is a different thing altogether when this passes from stimulus into motive the exclusive motive of profit of the producer 
the worth of the article is impaired as much as the well-being of the craftsman and furniture is degraded to the position of a pawn in the game of the sweater we must i fear be content at present to put up with exhibitions and unarchitectural rooms but while making the best of these conditions we need not acquiesce in them or maintain their permanence at any rate we may fight a good fight with commercialism the evils of heartless and unloved production under the grind of an unnecessary greed are patent enough to lead us to reflect that we have after all in these matters a choice we need not spend our money on that which is not bread we can go for our furniture to the individual craftsman and not the commercial firm the penalty for so doing is no longer prohibitive in closing our remarks we cannot do better than repeat our initial axiom the art of furnishing lies with the room as much as with the furniture the old ways are still the only ways when we care for art sufficiently to summon her from her state prison house of exhibitions and galleries to live again in free life among us in our homes she will appear as a controlling force using not only painting and sculpture but all the decorative arts to shape room and furniture under one purpose of design whether we shall then give her the time-honored title of architecture or call her by another name is of no moment end of section 22section 23 of arts and crafts essays this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by betty b of the room and furniture by halsey ricardo the transient tenure that most of us have in our dwellings and the absorbing nature of the struggle that most of us have to make to win the necessary provisions of life prevent our encouraging the manufacture of well-wrought furniture we mean to outgrow our houses our lease expires after so many years and then we shall want an entirely different class of furniture consequently we purchase articles that have only sufficient life in them to last the brief period of our occupation and are content to abide by the want of appropriateness or beauty in the clear intention of some day surrounding ourselves with objects that shall be joys to us for the remainder of our life another deterrent condition to making a serious outlay in furniture is the instability of fashion each decade sees a new style and the furniture that we have acquired in the exercise of our experienced taste will in all probability be discarded by the impetuous purism of the succeeding generation at present we are suffering from such a catholicity of taste as sees good in everything and has an indifferent and tepid appreciation of all and sundry especially if consecrated by age this is mainly a reaction against the austerity of those moralists who preach the logic of construction and who required outward proof of the principles on which and by which each piece was designed another cause prejudicial to the growth of modern furniture is the canonization of old that tables and chairs should have lasted one hundred years is indeed proof that they were originally well made that the conditions of the moment of their make were better than they are now is possible and such aureole as is their due let us hasten to offer but to take advantage of their survival and to increase their number by facsimile reproduction is to paralyze all healthy growth of manufacture as an answer to the needs and habits of our ancestors of one hundred years ago both in construction and design let them serve as models showing the attitude of mind in which we should meet the problems of our day and so far as the needs and habits of the present time are unchanged 
as models of form not to be incorporated with our vernacular but which we should recognize as successful form and discover the plastic secrets of its shapes with this possession we may borrow what forms we will shapes of the end and far cathay the whole wide world is open to us of past imaginations and of the dreams of our own but without this master key the copying is slavish and the bondage of the task is both cruel and destructive cruel because mindless work can be reproduced more rapidly than thoughtful work can be invented and the rate of production affects the price of other articles of similar kind so that one dictates what the other shall receive and destructive because it treats the craftsman as a mere machine whose only standard can be mechanical excellence now all furniture that has any permanent value has been designed and wrought to meet the ends it had to serve and the careful elaboration of it gave its maker scope for his pleasure and occasion for his pride if a man really likes what he has got to do he will make great shifts to express and realize his pleasure he will choose carefully his materials and either in playfulness of fancy or in grave renunciation of the garniture of his art will put the stamp of his individuality on his work an example of living art in modern furniture is a costermonger's barrow affectionately put together carved and painted it expresses almost in words the pride and taste of its owner as long as we are capable of recognizing and sympathizing with the delight of the workman in the realization of his art our admiration of his work is a pretense and our encouragement of it blind and this blindness makes us insensitive as to whether the delight is really there or no consequently our patronage will most often be disastrous rather than helpful the value of furniture depends on the directness of its response to the requirements that called it into being and to the nature of the conditions that evoked it to obtain good furniture we must contrive that the conditions of its service are worthy conditions and not merely the dictates of our fancy or our sloth at the present moment modern furniture may be roughly divided into two classes furniture for service and furniture for display most of us however have to confine ourselves to the possession of serviceable furniture only and a more frank recognition of this limitation would assist us greatly in our selection if only we kept our real needs steadily before us how much more beauty we could import into our homes owing to lack of observation and of experienced canons of taste our fancies are caught by some chance object that pleases one of that huge collection of ephemeral articles which have been created to supply a want that hitherto has never been felt and as the cost of these fictions is by the nature of the case so low as to be of no great moment to us the thing is purchased and helps henceforth to swell the museum of incongruous accumulation that goes by the name of a furnished drawing-room a fancy so caught is soon outworn but the precept of economy forbids the discharge of the superfluous purchase and so it adds its unit to the sum of daily labor spent on its preservation and its appearance the burden of unnecessary toil is the index of the needlessness and cruelty with which we spend the labor of those whom need has put under our service and the sum of money spent on these ill-considered acquisitions which have gone to swell the general total of distress an ever-widening ring of bitter ripple might concentrated have purchased some one thing both beautiful and useful whose fashioning had been a pleasure to the artificer and whose presence was an increasing delight to the owner and an added unit to this world's wealth such indiscriminate collection defeats its own aim compare the way giovanni bellini fits up st jerome's study for him in the national gallery there is no stint of money evidently the saint gets all that he can properly want and he gets over and above the addition born of his denial the look of peace and calm in his room that can so seldom be found with us another reason why our rooms are so glaringly over furnished is that many of us aim at a standard of profusion 
in forgetfulness of the circumstances which created that standard families whose descent has been historic and whose home has been their pride accumulate in the lapse of time heirlooms of many kinds pictures furniture trinkets etc and as these increase in numbers the rooms in which they are contained become filled and crowded beyond what beauty or comfort permits and such sacrifice is justly made for the demands of filial pride this emotion is so conspicuously an honourable one that we are all eager to possess and give scope to our own and so long as the scope is honest there is nothing more laudable but the temptation is to add to our uninherited display in this particular by substitutes and to surround ourselves with immemorable articles the justification of whose presence really should be that they form part of the history of our lives in more important respects than the mere occasions of their purchase it is this unreasoning ambition that leads to the rivalling of princely houses by the acquisition of family portraits purchased in wardour street the rivalling of historic libraries by the purchase of thousands of books to form our yesterday's libraries of undisturbed volumes the rivalling of memorable chairs and tables by recently bought articles of our own crowded in imitation of our model with innumerable trifles to the infinite tax of our space our patience and our purse our want of care and restraint in the selection of our furniture affects both its design and manufacture constantly articles are bought for temporary use we postponing the responsibility of wise purchase until we have more time or else we buy what is not precisely what we want but which must do since we cannot wait to have the exact things made and have not the time to search elsewhere for them furniture in response to this demand must be made either so striking as to arrest the eye or so variedly serviceable as to meet some considerable proportion of the conflicting requirements made on it by the chance intending purchaser or else it must fall back on the impregnable basis of antiquity and silence all argument with the canon that what the late mr chippendale did was bound to be good taste there should be a place for everything and everything in its place very true but in the exercise of our orderliness we require the hearty cooperation of the place itself tis a wonderful aid when the place fits the object it is intended to contain take the common male chest of drawers as a case in point its function is to hold a man's shirts and his clothes articles of a known and constant size why are the drawers not made proportionate for their duty why are they so few and so deep that when filled as they needs must be they are uneasy to draw out and to obtain the particular article of which we are in quest and which of course is at the bottom we must burrow into the heavy superincumbent mass of clothes in our search and that successful spend a weary while in contriving to repack the ill-disposed space it can hardly be economy of labour and material that dictates this for if so why is the usual hanging wardrobe made so preposterously too tall does the idiot maker suppose that a woman's dress is hung all in one piece body and skirt from the nape of the neck to trail its extremest length the art of buying furniture or having it made for us is to be acquired only by study and pains and we must either pursue the necessary education or depute the furnishing of our rooms to competent hands and the responsibility does not end here for there is the duty of discovering who are competent and this must be done indirectly since direct inquiry only elicits the one criterion omnipotent omnipresent of cost the object to be gained in furnishing a room is to supply the just requirements of the occupants to accentuate or further the character of the room and to indicate the individual habits and tastes of the owner each piece should be beautiful in itself and still more important should minister to and increase the beauty of the others collective beauty is to be aimed at not so much individual proportion is another essential not that the proportions of furniture should vary with the size of the rooms the dimensions of chairs 
height of tables sizes of doors have long been all fixed and having direct reference to the human body are immutable substantially the size of man's body is the same and has been the same from the dawn of history until now and will be the same whether in a cottage parlor or the albert hall but there is a proportion in the relations of the spaces of a room to its furniture which must be secured if this is not done no individual beauty of the objects in the room will repair the lost harmony or be compensation for the picture that might have been a museum of beautiful objects has its educational value but no one pretends that it claims to be more than a storehouse of beauty the painter who crowds his canvas with the innumerable spots of color that can be squeezed out of every tube of beautiful paint that the colorman sells is no nearer his goal than he who fills his rooms with a heterogeneous miscellany of articles swept together from every clime and of every age halsey ricardo end of section twenty three section twenty four of arts and craft essays this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b the english tradition by reginald blomfield the sense of a consecutive tradition has so completely faded out of english art that it has become difficult to realize the meaning of tradition or the possibility of its ever again reviving and this state of things is not improved by the fact that it is due to uncertainty of purpose and not to any burning fever of individualism tradition in art is a matter of environment of intellectual atmosphere as the result of many generations of work along one continuous line there is accumulated a certain amount of ability in design and manual dexterity certain ideas are in the air certain ways of doing things come to be recognized as the right ways to all this endowment an artist born in any of the living ages of art succeeded as a matter of course and it is the absence of this inherited knowledge that places the modern craftsman under exceptional disabilities there is evidence to prove the existence in england of hereditary crafts in which the son succeeded the father for generations and to show that the guilds were rather the guardians of high traditional skill than mere trades unions but there is surer proof of a common thread of tradition in certain qualities all along the line which gave to english work a character peculiar to itself instances of genuine gothic furniture are rare in england at any rate it was usually simple and solid sufficient to answer the needs of an age without any highly developed sense of the luxuries of life it is not till the renaissance that much material can be found for a history of english furniture much of the motif of this work came from italy and the netherlands indeed cabinet work was imported largely from the latter country it was just here however that tradition stepped in and gave to our sixteenth and seventeenth century furniture a distinctly national character the delicate mouldings the skilful turnings the quiet inlays of ebony ivory cherry wood and walnut above all the breadth and sobriety of its design point to a tradition of craftsmanship strong enough to assimilate all the ideas which it borrowed from other ages and other countries contrast for instance a piece of tottenham court road marquetry with a mother-of-pearl and ebony inlay on an english cabinet at south kensington so far as mere skill in cutting goes there may be no great difference between the two but the latter is charming and the former tedious in the last degree and the reason is that in the seventeenth century the craftsman loved his work and was master of it he started with an idea in his head and used his material with meaning and so his inlay is as fanciful as the seaweed and yet entirely subordinated to the harmony of the whole design perhaps some of the best furniture work ever done in england was done between sixteen hundred and sixteen sixty i refer of course to the good examples 
to work which depended for its effect on refined design and delicate detail not to the bulbous legs and coarse carving of ordinary elizabethan though even this had a naivete and spontaneity entirely lacking in modern reproductions after the restoration signs of french influence appear in english furniture but the tradition of structural fitness and dignity of design was preserved through the great architectural age of wren and gibbs and lasted till the latter half of the eighteenth century if that century was not particularly inspired it at least understood consummate workmanship the average of technical skill in the handicrafts was far in advance of the ordinary trade work of the present day some curious evidences of the activity prevailing in what are called the minor arts may be found in the laboratory and school of arts a small octavo volume published in seventeen thirty eight the work of this period furnishes a standing instance of the value of tradition by the beginning of the eighteenth century a school of carvers had grown up in england who could carve with absolute precision and without mechanical aids all such ornament as egg and tongue work or the acanthus and other conventional foliage used for the decoration of the mouldings of doors mantelpieces and the like grinling gibbons is usually named as the founder of this school but gibbons was himself trained by such men as wren and gibbs and for the source from which this work derives the real stamp of style one must go back to the austere genius of inigo jones the importance of the architect in influencing craftsmen in all such matters as this cannot be overrated he has or ought to have sufficient knowledge of the crafts to settle for the craftsman the all-important points of scale and proportion to the rest of the design and this is just one of those points in which contemporary architecture both as regards the education of the architect and current practice is exceedingly apt to fail sir william chambers and the brothers adam were the last of the architects before the cataclysm of the nineteenth century who made designs for furniture with any degree of skill in the latter half of the eighteenth century occur the familiar names of chippendale hepplewhite and sheraton and if these excellent cabinet makers did a tenth of the work with which the dealers credit them they must each have had the hundred hands of gaius the rosewood furniture inlaid with arabesques in thin flat brass and made by gillow at the end of the last century is perhaps the last genuine effort in english furniture though the tradition of good work and simple design died very hard in old-fashioned country places the mischief began with the ridiculous medievalism of horace walpole which substituted amateur fancy for craftsmanship and led in the following century to the complete extinction of any tradition whatever the heavy attempts at furniture in the greek style which accompanied the architecture of wilkins and soane were as artificial as this literary gothic and the two resulted in the chaos of art which found its expression in the great exhibition of eighteen fifty one three great qualities stamped the english tradition in furniture so long as it was a living force steadfastness of purpose reserve in design and thorough workmanship take any good period of english furniture and one finds certain well-recognized types consistently adhered to throughout the country there is no difficulty in grasping their general characteristics whereas the very genius of classification could furnish no clue to the labyrinth of nineteenth-century design the men of these earlier times made no laborious search for quaintness no disordered attempt to combine the peculiarities of a dozen different ages one general type was adhered to because it was the legacy of generations and there was no reason for departing from such an excellent model the designers and the workmen had only to perfect what was already good they made no experiments in ornament but used it with nice judgment and full knowledge of its effect the result was that instead of being forced and unreasonable their work was thoroughly happy one cannot think of it as better done than it is the quality of reserve and sobriety is even more important 
as compared with the later developments of the renaissance on the continent english furniture was always distinguished by its simplicity and self-restraint yet it is this very quality which is most conspicuously absent from modern work as a people we rather pride ourselves on the resolute suppression of any florid display of feeling but art in this country is so completely divorced from everyday existence that it never seems to occur to an englishman to import some of this fine insular quality into his daily surroundings it has been reserved for this generation to part company with the tradition of finished workmanship good work of course can be done but it is exceedingly difficult to find the workman and the average is bad we have nothing to take the place of the admirable craftsmanship of the last century which included not only great manual skill but also an assured knowledge of the purpose of any given piece of furniture of the form best suited for it and the exact strength of material necessary a knowledge which came of long familiarity with the difficulties of design and execution which never hesitated in its technique which attained a rightness of method so complete as to seem inevitable craftsmanship of this order hardly exists nowadays it is the result of tradition of the labor of many generations of cunning workmen lastly as the complement of these lapses on the part of the craftsman there has been a gradual decadence in the taste of the public science and mechanical ingenuity have gone far to destroy the art of the handicrafts art is a matter of the imagination and of the skill of one's hands but the pace nowadays is too much for it certainly from the sixteenth to the eighteenth century a well-educated english gentleman had some knowledge of the arts and especially of architecture the earl of burlington even designed important buildings though not with remarkable success but at any rate educated people had some insight into the arts whether inherited or acquired nowadays good education and breeding are no guarantee for anything of the sort unless it is some miscellaneous knowledge of pictures few people outside the artists and not too many of them give any serious attention to architecture and sculpture and consequently an art such as furniture which is based almost entirely upon these is hardly recognized by the public as an art at all how much the artist and his public react upon each other is shown by the plain fact that up to the last few years they have steadily marched downhill together and it is not very certain that they have yet begun to turn the corner that our english tradition was once a living thing is shown by the beautiful furniture purely english in design and execution still to be seen in great houses and museums but it is not likely that such a tradition will spring up again till the artist try to make the unity of the arts a real thing and the craftsman grows callous to fashion and archaeology and the public resolutely turns its back on what is tawdry and silly reginald blomfield end of section twenty four section twenty five of arts and crafts essays this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by peter yearsley carpenter's furniture by w r leatherby it requires a far search to gather up examples of furniture really representative in this kind and thus to gain a point of view for a prospect into the more ideal where furniture no longer is bought to look expensively useless in a boudoir but serves every day and commonplace need such as must always be the wont where most men work and exchange in some sort life for life the best present-day example is the deal table in those last places to be vulgarized farmhouse or cottage kitchen but in the middle ages things as simply made as a kitchen table mere carpenter's framings were decorated to the utmost stretch of the imagination by means simple and rude as their construction design indeed really fresh and penetrating coexists it seems only with simplest conditions 
simple serviceable movables fall into few kinds the box cupboard and table the stool bench and chair the box was once the most frequent useful and beautiful of all these now it is never made as furniture often it was seat coffer and table in one with checkers inlaid on the top for chess there are a great number of chests in england as early as the thirteenth century one type of construction perhaps the earliest is to clamp the woodwork together and beautifully decorate it by branching scrolls of ironwork another kind was ornamented by a sort of butter print patterning cut into the wood in ingenious fillings to squares and circles which you can imitate by drawing the intersecting lines the compasses seem to make of their own will in a circle and cutting down each space to a shallow v this simple carpenter's decoration is especially identified with chests the same kind of work is still done in iceland and norway the separate compartments often brightly painted into a mosaic of colour or patterns of simple scroll work are made out in incised line and space in italy this charming art of incising was carried much farther in the cassoni the fronts of which broad planks of cypress wood are often romantic with quite a tapestry of kings and ladies beasts birds and foliage cut in outline with a knife and punched with dots the cavities being filled with a coloured mastic like sealing wax panelling rough inlaying in the solid carving and painting and casing with repoussé or pierced metal or covering with leather incised into designs and making out patterns with nail heads were all methods of decoration used by the maker of boxes other examples and those not in the least stately had no other ornament than the purfling at the edges formed by ingeniously elaborate dovetails fitted together like a puzzle and showing a pattern like an inlay when people work naturally it is as wearisome and unnecessary often to repeat the same design as to continually paint the same picture design comes by designing on the one hand tradition carefully and continuously shapes the object to fill its use on the other spontaneous and eager excursions are made into the limitless fields of beautiful device where construction and form are thus the result of a long tradition undisturbed by fashion they are always absolutely right as to use and distinctive as to beauty the construction being not only visible but one with the decoration take a present-day survival the large country cart the body shaped like the waist of a sailing ship and every rail and upright unalterably logical and then decorated by quaint chamferings the facets of which are made out in brightest paint or look at an old table always with stretching rails at the bottom and framed together with strong tenons and cross pins into turned posts but so thoughtfully done that every one is original and all beautiful turning a delightful old art half for convenience half for beauty itself comes down to us from long before the conquest the great charm in furniture of the simplest structure may best be seen in old illuminated manuscripts where a chest a bench and against the wall a cupboard the top rising in steps where are set out tall venice glasses or a garnish of plate under a tester of some bright stuff make up a whole of fairy beauty in the frank simplicity of the forms and the innocent gaiety of bright colour take the saint jerome in his study of durer or bellini and compare the dignity of serene and satisfying order with the most beautifully furnished room you know how vulgar our good taste appears and how foreign to the end of culture peace from records and what remains to us we know that the room the hangings and the furniture were patterned all over with scattered flowers and inscriptions violets and the words bon pensé or vases of lilies and packs angels and incense pots ciphers and initials 
badges and devices, or whatever there be of suggestion and mystery. The panelling and furniture were green like a curtain, as the old accounts have it, or vermilion and white, like some painted chairs at Knoll, or even decorated with paintings and gilt gesso patterns, like the Norfolk screens. Fancy a bed with the underside of the canopy having an annunciation or spreading trellis of roses, and the chamber carved like one in thirteenth-century romance. Na el monde best loisel, qui ni soit oeuvre si If we would know how far we are from the soul of art, we have but to remember that all this the romance element in design, the joy in life, nature, and colour, which in one past development we call Gothic, and which is ever the well of beauty undefiled, is not now so much impossible of attainment as entirely out of range with our spirit and life, a felt anachronism and affectation. All art is sentiment embodied in form. To find beauty we must consider what really gives us pleasure, pleasure, not pride, and show our unashamed delight in it. And so, when we have leisure to be happy and strength to be simple, we shall find art again, the art of the workman. W. R. Leatherby End of section 25《Of Arts and Crafts Essays》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Shasta, Oakland, California. — Of Decorated Furniture by J. H. Poland decorated or sumptuous furniture is not merely furniture that is expensive to buy but that which has been elaborated with much thought knowledge and skill such furniture cannot be cheap certainly but the real cost of it is sometimes borne by the artist who produces rather than by the man who may happen to buy it furniture on which valuable labor is bestowed may consist of one large standing objects which though actually movable are practically fixtures such as cabinets presses sideboards of various kinds monumental objects two chairs tables of convenient shapes stands for lights and other purposes coffers caskets mirror and picture frames three numberless small convenient utensils here we can but notice class one the large standing objects which most absorb the energies of artists of every degree and order in their construction or decoration cabinets seem to have been so named as being little strongholds offices of men of business for stowing papers and documents in orderly receptacles they are secured with the best locks procurable they often contain secret drawers and cavities hidden from all eyes but those of the owner nor are instances wanting of owners leaving no information on these matters to their heirs so that casual buyers sometimes come in for a windfall or such a catastrophe as befell the owner of richard the third's bed it is not to be expected that elaborate systems of secret drawers and hiding places should be contrived in cabinets of our time money and jewels are considered safer when deposited in banks but ingenuity of construction in a complicated piece of furniture must certainly be counted as one of its perfections sound and accurate joinery with well-seasoned woods properly understood as to shrinkage and as to the relations between one kind of timber and another in these respects is no small merit 
some old english cabinets are to be met with in the construction of which wood only is used the mortising admirable the boards used to hold ends and divisions together from end to end strained and secured by wedges that turn on pivots etc furniture of this kind can be taken to pieces and set up resuming proper rigidity totius quotius to look at the subject historically it seems that the cabinet dresser or sideboard is a chest set on legs and that the press or cupboard closet not proper cupboard takes the place of the paneled recess closed by doors generally contrived and sometimes ingeniously hidden in the construction of a panelled room the front of an elevated chest is hinged and flaps down while the lid is a fixture the interior is more complicated than that of the chest as its subdivisions are more conveniently reached before leaving this part of the subject it is worth notice that the architectural or rather architectonic character seems to have deeply impressed the makers of cabinets when the chest type had gradually been lost italian german english and other cabinets are often found representing a church front or a house front with columns doors sometimes ebony and ivory pavements etc next as to methods of decorating cabinets the kind which deserves our first attention is that of sculpture here undoubtedly we must look to the italians as our masters and to that admirable school of wood carving which maintained itself so long in flanders with an italian grace grafted on the ingenuity vigor and playfulness of a northern race our english carvers admirable craftsmen during the fifteenth and sixteenth centuries seem to have been closely allied with the contemporary flemings fronts of cabinets dressers chimney pieces etc were imported from belgium and were made up by english joiners with panelling supplemented with carving where required for our great houses but the best italian carving remains on chests and chest fronts which were made in great numbers in the sixteenth century some of these chests are toilet chests some have formed wolf seats laid along the sides of halls and galleries to hold hangings etc when the house was empty and have served as seats or as monumental pieces when company was received as the chest grew into the cabinet or bureau or dresser great attention was paid to the supports it hardly needed to be pointed out that for the support of seats tables etc animals typical of strength or other qualities the lion or the sphinx the horse sometimes the slave have been employed by long traditional usage and carvers of wood have not failed to give attention to the use and decoration of conventional supports to the furniture now under discussion they are made to unite the central mass to a shallow base leaving the remaining space open next to sculptured decoration comes encrusted the most costly kinds of materials precious stones such as lapis lazuli agate rare marbles etc have been employed on furniture surfaces but such work is rather than of lapidary than of the cabinet maker it is very costly and seems to have been confined in fact to the factories kept up in italy russia and other states at government expense we do not produce them in this country 
and the number of such objects is probably limited wherever we look for them incrustation of precious woods is a more natural system of wood decoration veneered wood which is laid on a roughened surface with thin glue at immense pressure if well made is very long-lived the woods used give a colored surface and are polished so as to bring the color fully out and to protect the material from damp in fine examples the veneers form little pictures or patterns either by the arrangement of the grain of the pieces used so as to make pictorial lines by means of the grain itself or by using woods of various colors a very fine surface decoration was invented or carried to perfection by andre charles boulet for louis the fourteenth it is a veneer of tortoise shell and brass with occasional white metal an important element in bully decoration is noticeable in the chiseled angle mounts lines of moulding claws feet etc all of which are imposed though they have the general character of metal angle supports in fact the tortoise shell is held by glue and the metal by fine nails of the same material the heads of which are filed down incrustation or marquetry of this kind is costly and most of it is due to the labors of artists and craftsmen employed by the kings of france at the expense of, of the government a considerable quantity of it is still made in that country now as to the way in which sculptors or encrusters should dispose of their decoration and the fidelity to nature which is to be expected of them whether in sculpture or wood mosaic that is wood painting first we may suppose they will concentrate their more important details in recognizable divisions of their pieces or in such ways that a proportion and rhythm shall be expressed by their dispositions of masses and fine details placing their figures in central panels on angles or on dividing members leaving some plain surface to set off their decorative detail and taking care that the contours of running mouldings shall not be lost sight of by the carver but how far is absolute natural truth even absolute obedience to the laws of his art in every particular of his details to be expected from the artist we cannot doubt that such absolute obedience is sometimes departed from intentionally and with success all greek architecture is not always absolutely true to nature nor as beautiful as the sculptor if free could have made it statues are conventionalized decorative scrolls exaggerated figures turned into columns for good reasons and in the result successfully in furniture as in architecture carved work or encrustation is not free but is in service and compromises with verisimilitude to nature even violence may sometimes be required on details in the interests of the entire structure next let a word or two be reserved for painted furniture painting has been employed on furniture of all kinds at many periods the ancients made theirs of bronze or of ivory carved or inlaid in the middle ages wood carving and many kinds of furniture were painted the coronation chair at westminster was so decorated the chest fronts of delhi and other painters are often pictures of great intrinsic merit and very generally these family chest fronts are valuable records of costumes and fashions of their day 
in this country the practice of painting pianoforte cases chair backs table tops panels of all sorts have been much resorted to distinguished painters angelica kaufman and her contemporaries and a whole race of coach painters have left monuments of their skill in this line it must suffice here to recall certain modern examples for example a small dresser now in the national collections with doors painted by mr pointer with spirited figures represented the beers and the wines the fine piano case painted by mr burne jones another by mr alma tadima lastly a tall clock case by mr stanhope which as well as other promising examples have been exhibited by the arts and crafts society End of section 26section 27 of arts and crafts essays this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org of carving by stephen webb it is not uncommon to see an elaborate piece of furniture in decorating which it is evident that the carver has had opportunity for the exercise of all his skill and which indeed bears evidence of the most skilful wood cutting on almost every square inch of its surface from the contemplation of which neither an artist nor an educated craftsman can derive any pleasure or satisfaction this would seem to point to the designer of the ornament as the cause of failure and the writer of this believes that in such cases it will generally be found that the designer though he may know everything that he ought to know about the production of designs which shall look well on paper or on a flat surface has had no experience by actually working at the material of its difficulties special capabilities or limitations if at the same time he has had but a limited experience of the difference in treatment necessary for carving which is to be seen at various altitudes his failure may be taken as sufficiently accounted for an idea now prevalent that it is not advisable to make models for wood carving is not by any means borne out by the experience of the writer of this paper models are certainly not necessary for ordinary work such as mouldings or even for work in panels when the surfaces are intended to be almost wholly on one plane but the carved decoration of a panel which pretends to be in any degree a work of art often depends for its effect quite as much on the masterly treatment of surface planes and the relative projection from the surface of the more prominent parts as upon the outline now there are many men who though able to carve wood exquisitely have never given themselves the trouble or perhaps have scarcely had the opportunity to learn how to read an ordinary drawing the practice obtains in many carving shops for one or two leading men to rough out namely shape out roughly all the work so far as that is practicable and the others take it up after them and finish it the followers are not necessarily less skilful carvers or cutters than the leaders but have presumably less knowledge of form if then one wishes to avail oneself of the skill of these men for carrying out really important work 
it is much the simpler way to make a model however rough which shall accurately express everything one wishes to see in the finished work and assuming the designer to be fairly dexterous in the use of clay or other plastic material a sketch model will not occupy any more of his time than a drawing would to put it plainly no designer can ever know what he ought to expect from a worker in any material if he has not worked in that material himself if he has carved marble for instance he knows the extreme care required in undercutting the projecting parts of the design and the cost entailed by the processes necessary to be employed for that purpose he therefore so arranges the various parts of his design that wherever it is possible these projecting portions shall be supported by other forms so avoiding the labour and cost of relieving or undercutting them and if he be skilful his skill will appear in the fact that his motive in this will be apparent only to experts while to others the whole will appear to grow naturally out of the design moreover he knows that he must depend for the success of this thing on an effect of breadth and dignity he is not afraid of a somewhat elaborate surface treatment being aware that nearly any variety of surface which he can readily produce in clay may be rendered in marble with a reasonable amount of trouble in designing for the woodcarver he is on altogether different ground he may safely lay aside some portion of his late dignity and depend almost entirely on vigour of line the ease with which undercutting is done in this material enabling him to obtain contrast by the use of delicately relieved forms here however he must not allow the effect in his model to depend in any degree on surface treatment care in that respect will prevent disappointment in the finished work the most noticeable feature in modern carved surface decoration is the almost universal tendency to overcrowding it appears seldom to have occurred to the craftsman or designer that decorating a panel for instance is not at all the same thing as covering it with decoration still less does he seem to have felt that occasionally some portions of the ground are much more valuable in the design than anything which he can put on them indeed the thoughtful designer who understands its use and appreciates its value frequently has more trouble with his ground than with anything else in the panel also if he have the true decorative spirit his mind is constantly on the general scheme surrounding his work and he is always ready to subordinate himself and his work in order that it may enhance and not disturb this general scheme we will suppose for example that he has to decorate a column with raised ornament he feels at once that the outlines of that column are of infinitely more importance than anything which he can put on it however ingenious or beautiful his design may be he therefore keeps his necessary projecting parts as small and low as possible leaving as much of the column as he can showing between the lines of his pattern by this means the idea of strength and support is not interfered with and the tout ensemble is not destroyed this may seem somewhat elementary to many who will read it 
my excuse must be that one sees many columns in which every vestige of the outline is so covered by the carving which has been built round them that the idea of their supporting anything other than their ornament appears preposterous there has been no opportunity to do more than glance at such a subject as this in a space so limited but the purposes of this paper will have been served if it has supplied a useful hint to any craftsman or if by its means any designer shall have been induced to make a more thorough study of the materials within his reach End of section twenty seven Section twenty eight of Arts and Crafts Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Intarsia and Inlaid Woodwork by T. G. Jackson. Although decoration by inlaying woods of different colors must naturally have suggested itself in very early times as soon indeed as there were workmen of skill sufficient for it the history of this branch of art practically begins in the fifteenth century it is eminently an italian art which according to vasari had its origin in the days of brunelleschi and paolo uccello and it had its birth in a land which has a greater variety of mild close-grained woods with a greater variety of color than northern europe by the Italians it was regarded as a lower form of painting. Like all mosaic, of which art it is properly a branch, it has its limitations, and it is only so long as it confines itself to these that it is a legitimate form of decoration. Tarsia is at the best one of the minor decorative arts, but when well employed it is one that gives an immense deal of pleasure, and one to which it cannot be denied that the buildings of italy owe much of their splendor their polished and inlaid furniture harmonizes with the rare delicacy of their marble and mosaic and goes far towards producing that air of rich refinement and elaborate culture which is to the severer styles and simpler materials of the north what the velvet robed senator of st mark was to the mail-clad feudal chief from beyond the alps as to its durability the experience of four centuries since vasari's time has proved that with ordinary care or perhaps with nothing worse than mere neglect intarsia will last as long as painting its only real enemy is damp as will be readily understood from the nature of the materials and the mode of putting them together for though in a few instances when the art was in its infancy the inlaid pattern may have been cut of a substantial thickness and sunk into a solid ground ploughed out to receive it this method was obviously very laborious and admitted only a very simple design for it is very difficult in this way to keep the lines of the drawing accurately the recognized way of making intarsia was and is to form both pattern and ground in thin veneers about one sixteenth of an inch thick which are glued down upon a solid panel at first sight this method may appear too slight and unsubstantial for work intended to last for centuries but it has in fact stood the test of time extremely well when the work has been kept in the dry even temperature of churches and great houses where there is neither damp to melt the glue and swell the veneer nor excessive heat to make the wood shrink and start asunder when these conditions were not observed of course the work was soon ruined and vasari tells an amusing story of the humiliation which befell benedetto da magiano who began his career as an intarsiatore in the matter of two splendid chests which he had made for matthias corvinus from which the veneers loosened by the damp of a sea voyage fell off in the royal presence the veneers being so thin it is of course easy to cut through several layers of them at once 
and this suggested or at all events lent itself admirably to the design of the earlier examples which are generally arabesques symmetrically